Can you see my screen? Yes, yes sir. very good. OK, all good. So yeah, so the presentation is about um, data analysis of embodied carbon of materials. Um, so first I will start with the um, basic concept of what is life cycle assessment. So life cycle assessment is measuring the emissions for the whole life cycle of the building and life cycle assessment has different phases uh, starting from um, product stage, which is A1 and then to towards the end of life, which is a C phase. And then we also have a D phase, which is beyond um, uh, building benefits. And then the life cycle assessment further, these all phases are further divided into embodied carbon or embodied impact and the operational impact. So embodied carbons are all the phases except B6 and B7, which is operational energy and operational water, which comes under the uh, operational impacts. So here we is, so my, my presentation is focused on embodied uh, carbon and mainly for the materials, which is the product stage, which starting from A1 to A3. So A1 is um, extraction of those raw materials. A2 is the transport of those materials to the manufacturing site, and A3 is the manufacturing of those materials. So all the emissions coming out from that process is A1 to A3 embodied carbon. So there's an important concept when we are selecting our material or our product for, for the building. So we need to consider three factors. Um, the first one is um, quantity of the materials. So if you could reduce the quantities is better. The second second key factor is the emission factors. So is um, so emission factor is the, um, the emissions coming out per kilogram of materials and it is defined as kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilogram of material. And third important factor is the design life of that product. So by balancing these three factors, we can find our optimum emissions or optimum product that we need to use. So I will discuss about what is optimized embodied carbon emissions. And here is an example from one of the case studies. It's a project that we did in Melbourne. So generally when we do life cycle assessment, we uh, divide our building into different elements. And these elements are like concrete, doors, um, external walls, finishes, flooring, metalwork reinforcements. Um, and then we can further divide these elements into materials. So materials are single units, for example, um, ceramics, timbers, paints, plastic, glass, aluminium. Mm. So these comes under the materials category. So if um, I look at the total emissions contributions of those elements that, that I mentioned on the left side of slide. So um, reinforcement steel, has the highest emissions contribution, which is around 38%. Concrete is the second one, 34%. Glazing and facade, which mainly contain aluminum. So they has the th third largest contributor of the total uh, emissions towards the project. But then there are some other materials uh, which 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 are made which are used to make flooring, ceilings, and walls and partitions. So they also have some emissions, but not as compared to concrete, steel, and aluminum. And if I further elaborate or divide into the big categories. So you can say that other materials are around about 20%. So this is still a very high quantity. It's not it's not that 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 we can that we can ignore. So concrete, steel, aluminium, and then there's a fourth category which is other materials. So if we want to optimize our emissions for those other materials, first we have to look at the quantities of those materials that we are using for that project. So this is a comparison between the quantities and the total emissions coming out from those materials. So we can see that this this white bar is the quantity and the purple bar is uh, carbon emissions. So you can see that we have we have used a large amount of concrete, but the emissions associated with them are are less. Um, quantity is high, emissions are less. For say, for the reinforcement steel, our quantity is less and emissions coming out from the steel is higher. But if you look at some other materials, which is not concrete, aluminium and, and uh, steel, for example, flooring, mechanical services, so you can see that their quantities used is less, the con quantity contribution towards the project is less, but their total emissions are higher, which means these materials are more um, 
emissions intensive as compared to concrete because less quantities, higher emissions. The second factor is the emission factors that we need to consider. So if we look at all the materials, all the elements, our glazing facade has the highest emissions emission factor, which is kilogram CO2 per kilogram, and they are mainly composed of aluminium and glass. The second is metalwork. Metalwork also composed of aluminium and steel. So these two components has the highest emission factors. But third one is the services. Services has all different kinds of materials. So what does services include? So services includes aluminium foil, nylon, epoxy, copper, titanium, polyester, rubber. So if you look at graph, uh, aluminium foil definitely has the highest emission factor, but second one is the nylon, epoxy, and copper. So, so we also need to consider these ones because the emissions that we are getting from these materials are higher as compared to even concrete and external wall, which is right at the bottom in the graph. Uh, the third factor after this one is the design life. We also need to consider the design life. So we have an example here. So we just look at the floorings. So flooring has can be made from different tiles, wool carpet tiles, vinyl flooring, rubber flooring, nylon flooring. So if you look at vinyl flooring, it has the highest emission factors, but its design life is also higher. For nylon carpet tiles right at the bottom of the graph, it has a lower emission factor, but its design life is less. So if, for example, if we are looking at the EPDs, We'll go for we generally what we look at the EPDs. We look at the emission factors, and if the emission factor is small, we select that EPD or select that product. But but we also need to look at the design life. So here is an example. So our building is generally 60 years. The life of the building is 60 years. So if we magnify these two pro, uh, products, uh, nylon carpet and vinyl carpet. So for 60 years, nylon carpet has the highest emissions because its design life is less, although its emission factor is small. That's how we need to consider factor in the design life. Then after this one, by considering all these three factors, the emission factors, quantities, and the design life, we need to answer these questions when we are deciding our materials. Um, should our selection be only based on the emission factors or or should we, should our selection be based on the quantities? Do we need a higher quantity of vinyl flooring to do the same job as we are doing with the nylon carpets? Or uh, is the less materials, less emission factors and a long design life is the optimum solution? This is another question. Uh, what other factors that we need to consider? Other factors, which means um, if everything has been optimized, then we start looking into its recycling rate or the recovery rate or the durability of the products. And then the final question is, yes, these are the design lives, but what is the actual life? Because in the case of carpet, might be tenants moved after five years or six years, seven years, and they want to replace that material. So in that case, if we are using vinyl carpets or nylon carpets, both have the same life of six, seven years. But then the question arises, what is the recycling and recovery of those materials after that life? So in this way, like if we have all that data for the decision making, then we, it will be easy for us to collect that data that we want. For example, in case of steel, aluminum, and concrete and timber, so they are single materials. For example, steels come in, wrought steel, aluminum foils, concrete with the different strengths, and the same for the timber. But when we look at other materials, they are generally do not come as a single material. So they are the modular or the composite materials. For example, in the case of ceiling, the ceiling is made from aluminum, plasterboard, maybe some textile or, or plastics. So they are a combination of the materials. And this is how the EPD are presented. So when we are extracting data from EPD, we have to be careful that we have to disintegrate all the components and look at each component separately so that we can do the better decision making. For example, this ceiling system might has a very low uh, emission factor aluminum, but might have a very high emission factor of plastics. So we cannot just be decide based on the total emissions of this ceiling system. We need to go into the each of the material that it composed of. The second factor is the reporting data. So we have to be consistent with our benchmarking. It's no matter how good our sustainability initiatives or selections are, if our benchmarks are not consistent, 
across all the products and projects, so we cannot get, get the good results. And also when we are looking at the EPTs, we have to look at the system boundaries as I've defined in the first slide that we are looking at A1 to A3. So if you are comparing different products, you should only look at A1 to A3. And if it is A1 to A5, so it should be across same for all, all projects. And this is what we need to look into um, when we are selecting our data. And then the final step is circularity. For example, if we have um, we have optimized our our material based on quantity emission factors and design life, then the next step is the circularity of that material. We have to define some kind of metric um, how circular that material is is being and what data is available to define the circularity. Uh, we need to look at the durability of the product, reusability, and its recycling, current recycling, up to date recycling rates. So we have to consider all those factors when we are collecting data. Um, so these are like a few key points that I wanted to discuss in the presentation about how we can analyze the data or better um, make the right choices when we selecting data. I think that's all from my, my side. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? I'm happy to answer any questions. I have some questions. Yep. Um, so thank you. That was a, that was a really great presentation and so clearly um, stated. That was fantastic. So I am doing a bit of research in this area um, around the consistency of data um, and the, the databases that everybody's accessing. So it's just, you know, I'm just kind of interested from your perspective what your thoughts are. Um, so for example, um, with the, um, you said that to be consistent that you're looking at A1 to A3 and making sure you're always using that information. Um, what about, have you, have you thought about the way that the data is achieved, like if it's hybrid information or the process or, or the combination? Do you look at that, those differences? Does that concern you at all? Um yeah if if we are specifically talking about hybrid and process emissions data so again my personal view is that uh, we need to be consistent with our reporting it's not like one data set we are using for reporting is hybrid one and second we are using for the process one so whatever we are using in the process one but definitely the process data is um, is more easily available most of our tools that we use generally we we are here in uh, land lease we are using gabby and its database is a process database we have a hybrid database that i think the reference is for gbca they are using hybrid one uh, but again we need to make it consistent because we cannot mix these two data when we are comparing between these two uh, two different products and if you are talking about like what phase we need to consider in the consistency A1 to A3 or A1 to A5. Again, it just depends on our selection because if we are looking at two EPDs, um, it's not just right that we just pick up one number emission factors and that's it. We need to look at EPD thoroughly. The functional unit is consistent. If one EPD is from A1 to A5, then the other EPD should also consider A1 to A5. Generally, what I have seen like, um, some some people who are doing the life cycle assessment, so they are not fully aware of that, and which creates some um, um, very wrong results in the end. So that's why I think consistency and is is important, and also in the database is important. Right now, process based data is uh, more is e easily available, so we would prefer that one to be used. Mm, that's great. I agree totally. Um, and it's good to know. So the research that we're going, that we are doing, is going to work out: is is there how much is the difference between, like, say, if someone did use A one to A five and A one to A three together, would that be a significant problem or not? And same with mixing up the data sources, so just to see, like, how significant that different difference is. And and I think, as you say, I suspect it may be. And then we some probably need to get the word out there to everyone, especially like Mekla. Um, am I allowed another question, Kathy? Um, I'm just wondering about the design um, 
the design life. Where did you get the, where do you find your, your information on how long a material is expected to live in place? So, for example, in this particular example, um, use some EPD values for nylon tiles and vinyl tiles. And in that EPD generally is mentions the design life or the service life of the product. Um, but when we when we are doing the modeling uh, life cycle assessment, um, we generally take those service life, design life, either it is 25 years, 100 years, 50 years. But we also aware that this is not actual design life. This is the design life that manufacturers have mentioned. General, like maybe the design life generally left for in the case of tiles and carpets is less than 25 years because if tenants moved in and move out, so they generally want to replace before 25 years. So we are currently not factoring in this thing. It's also a research topic that how we can like uh, define the actual design life, um, which will give us a true picture. But but I think for our models we use the design life provided by the manufacturers um, this is also interesting topic and important thing to consider like if we if one material has a lower emission and its design life is only five years then there's no point of selecting that because our our building life is 60 years so we have to multiply it by 12 to the emission factor term will be multiplied by 12 to get to get it to 60 years <laughs> something <Yeah>. like that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I noticed like with carpet tiles here at the uni, they have carpet tiles, and I and I understand the point of having carpet tiles is so we don't have to replace the whole carpet; we can just replace the tiles. But they just take all the tiles out and put a whole yeah. bunch of new carpet tiles, and it's really frustrating to see it happen. Sorry to hog the questions. Anyone else? Um, uh, I have a small question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mayor. Uh, uh, I saw in one of the report uh, the highest emission factor was glazing in the facade, um, and um, obviously from a uh, being from a glazing industry, it kind of caught my eyes. And just wanted to understand if it's possible to um, get some more insight on the the elements that actually contributed to us this uh, calculation of emission factor for glass. Because you know, obviously, if there are things that um, we understand is contributing more, um, then that's something that we'd be really interested to look into. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it depends on how we model our life cycle assessment and how we categorize our the materials. So these emission factor that I've just showed you is the average of those materials which are included that we have modeled in glazing and facade. Um, mainly, glazing and facade has glass and aluminium two main components and the emission factor that that is highly contributing towards this aluminium in australia aluminium uh, average emission factor is around 15 kilogram co2 per kilogram of materials which is higher than much higher than steel and concrete and any other main building materials so so is, is this answer to your question? So, and the second one is the glass one, which is yeah. around two to two to three kilograms CO2 per kilogram. So, but again, like if we are just taking glazing and facade, the only other materials that I think other than the aluminium is a glass one that, that we can further reduce down and look into how we can reduce down aluminium. Yeah. The only way to reduce aluminium emission currently in terms of technology is um, to use the hydroelectricity to produce yeah. aluminium. Uh, one of our project um, in land lease, um, we actually um, uh, procure aluminium from the from the manufacturer who was using hydroelectricity, not in Australia, but from somewhere else, and it reduced our total embodied carbon emission by 50%. So this is how al how much aluminium has impact towards the embodied right. carbon, and this is one of our focused. Uh, I'm, uh, mainly, I was interested from glass perspective because uh, the, the, the embodied carbon of the glass uh, uh, would have really depend uh, on the type of glass that have been used, uh, you know, in the, in the various projects. Um, and and I, I think the, the that number can be greatly, uh, you know, increased if uh, um, if we consider uh, products that are being manufactured within Australia are, are the imported from, from overseas because you know that 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 way it would contribute towards a higher embodied carbon 
Um, so uh, just wanted to understand if if that um, research that we did included um, those both options. Yes. So 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 my calculation. So these calculations are based on A1 to A3, which means uh, we don't have A4 and A5 in this these calculations. A4 is transport, and then A5 is the construction of the building. So right now this do not include A4. Right. Um, so definitely it depends. We have to do a thorough life cycle assessment to see if we are uh, purchasing our material from Australia as compared to uh, importing from somewhere else. And then we are adding transportation emissions. So yeah, we need to factor in all those things. Yep. Thank you very much. That, that no makes it more clear. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else got any questions? I had a quick question. Um, thanks for that, Uma. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, just the, you started talking about circular circularity towards the end there and a circularity type indicator. I'm aware of um, an indicator from the Alan MacArthur Foundation, the Materials Circularity Index, the MCI. Um, I was just curious um, if, you, if you've seen that used or referenced often. Um, um, and um, where, where you see that fit into that circularity topic. Yeah, yeah, I think there are many, currently there are, there are many indicators available to my circularity, but there's, they are not being standardized. Um, like, um, for example, if you are doing life cycle assessment, so there are some standard um, procedures or European standards that we follow. And also how we selecting our reference is, is standardized by GBCA, but in terms of circularity, um, it's not generalized. Some of the EPDs I've seen, um, I think some steel EPDs, so they have uh, included that uh, circularity index from MacArthur um, Foundation, but it's not compulsory. So if everyone is not including that one, then then we might not be uh, we, we not we, we might not be considering it. But it's a good thing that. We need to we need to have that circularity index here in Australia uh, defined according to our needs, um, and it factors in because circularity index means it should somehow come up with the weighting factors and all those things include which contribute which accounts for re reusability, recovery rate, and recycling rate, and durability, everything, and need to come up with the factor that we can use across the board. I think that's the main idea. Currently, we are not including any circularity index for our calculations or base decisions make on that one. No, we are just doing the life cycle assessment. And as I mentioned, the D phase, the last life cycle assessment phase has some benefits beyond the building things, which means if we are that product is being used somewhere else, we can subtract it from the main life cycle assessment. So that's all. Um, definitely, we need a circularity index in our our calculations. Uh, Uma, I've got a question. I, um, you you meant you to look at the design life. Do you also take into account the the impact of the materials on the operational energy performance of the building? So things like just for use glass, for example, you go to higher performance glazing which has more embodied carbon, but it would have a reduction in your energy for heating and cooling. Does that come into it at all, or is that the, too complicated? It's a complicated, but we definitely consider this one because yeah. when we are, we are doing the full life cycle assessment and including our energy optimization and the energy emissions. So if our we are using double glazed windows and double glazed windows has a higher emission factors, but but double glass windows as reducing our energy consumptions, then then we will be using double glass one. So we need to balance out everything. So that's that's and that should be another key factors other than quantity emission factor and design. Yeah. But we are considering yeah. that one. Just something else to make it more complicated when you're yeah. I All think right. the once once things are things are modeled in and um, and consistent uh, in our model across the board so the modeling part is easy <laughs> it's not too much complicated we just need to consider at the beginning yeah i suppose that goes the same for concrete and thermal mass and things like that the benefit of that 
in your building for operational energy as well, but that was good. I can't see any other hands and no one's got a hand up or, um, but that was fabulous. Thanks so much, Umar. That was really good. Um, and I look forward to hearing how the net zero by 2025, um, that's not that far away. So maybe maybe at a future meeting, you can give us an update on how you're tracking to that for 2025. Yep, yep, we are, we are almost there. We are doing well. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>